so welcome everyone and thank you for joining the Startup Buddy Demo Day. Uh, my name is Robin. I'm the founder CEO of the Startup Buddy. Uh, the Startup Buddy is Singapore's online fundraising platform for founders and investors. We now have over 2,000 founders from 65 countries using our platform to develop new ideas into viable businesses uh, while they use our online academy, our toolkits, and our online net network of mentors. Another 600 investors are in our network through our newsletters and on the platform. And through their investor profile, they can keep track of how startups develop themselves through our platform and invest in them. Our goal is to become the online startup equity trading platform for founders and investors around the globe. It's supposed to become a place where founders and investors meet each other, work together to build sustainable new businesses, and grow companies through investment. Think of us as an online dating platform for the startup community. Now, we have been around for almost two and a half years. Uh, we initially built the startup part of our platform first, and in November, we launched the investor part of our platform, but we keep continuing in developing it. So in the past six weeks since the last demo day, we have made the dashboard cleaner and it's now easier to figure out how to connect to investors at the top of your dashboard. The menu is cleaner, all the toolkits have been grouped and everything is put under settings that you would expect to find there. And probably most important, the pitch builder that most founders use uh, has been simplified. If you want to publish to investors, all the information that you need to publish can be found under one section. For investors, we this month uh, launched the fund builder. So for all VCs, uh, VCs typically ra raise different funds over their life lifetime. And for this, they search for LPs. Now we've built a fund builder that will help you through all the questions that typically limited partners require you to have an answer to as a VC. And once you have set up your fund, you can actually push it to the limited partners in our platform and raise funding through the startup body. Something else that we'll launch very soon is the team function. It's already available for founders, but also for VC firms, it will now become possible to work together as a team on the startup body, share the different profiles and review them. And thirdly, you have probably seen in our social media channels already, uh, we'll start following up the demo days with another event called Speed Dating. Um, as of next week, 23rd of July, you can meet uh, amongst each other, investors and founders. Uh, the setup is going to be fairly straightforward. So it starts at five o'clock. Every investor gets to meet three different founders. Every founder gets to meet three different investors. We will do the matching based on your profiles on the startup body, based on things like industry, country, uh, level of fundraising, et cetera, et cetera. So if you wanna join that, please do. Um, you can do that by letting us know and by joining the startup body. Now for the investors, uh, both live and in the audience, if you wanna talk to any companies in, in particular next week, you will find them all now here uh, on the startup body when you log in will be sharing the URLs for their specific profiles as well. If you're interested in any of the companies, click the heart that is at the top of their profile and that will indicate to us that you're interested. So what are we gonna do today? Um, this is uh, most of my introduction, I'm almost done with it. Then we'll go to the investor pitch coaches and let them introduce themselves and I've come up with a question for all of them. Um, then we'll have a short talk by a professor of entrepreneurship from INSEAD, Professor Bala. Uh, he and Professor Reddy are doing a very interesting research about how networking works between uh, startups and their founders and the investor community. Uh, he will share a little bit about it and they're looking for more people to join the research. Then we'll go into the pitches. We'll do two rounds of two pitches. Um, and in between, we'll have Eric Hierowan, the COO of CoHive. He will explain a little bit more about what CoHive is. As probably all of you have seen, uh, they help us co-organize this. And they will also give out prizes at the end of uh, this demo day for the best questions. 
around 20 minutes past six, we'll go to the Q&A and then we'll go back to the investor pitch coaches and listen to the feedback that they have for all the founders that have been pitching. And finally, we'll close off by announcing who the winners are for the best question. And uh, that's the end of the program. Now the pitching itself. The pitching itself uh, will go in rounds of 10 minutes for each, com each company. And those 10 minutes, they have to divide in five minutes for their pitch and five minutes for Q&A. Um, I will be timing them and my background will switch when it's two minutes uh, to go, then it will turn orange. And when it's 30 seconds to go, it will turn red. So that's how everybody knows that the time is running out. Then uh, the first question goes to the investor pitch coach that has been matched with a particular company. And then we'll go through more questions for the five minutes uh, as long as we have. Now, like I already said, you can win prizes and we really like everybody to join in to ask questions. Uh, you can do so very simply by putting your question in the Q&A at the button in the Zoom. Um, make sure that you have a screen name uh, because otherwise we won't be able to figure out who's been winning. Um, also, let each other know like if you like a question by voting it up or down uh, with a little thumb that you can find in the Q&A section. So who are the companies that are going to pitch? Uh, we'll start with Kinex. Uh, which is presented by Abi, and his coach will be Sagar. Uh, second up is Wizlis, which is presented by Ivan, and his coach will be Will. Third up is Higher Place from Singapore, presented by Stuart, and his coach is Mana. And fourth is Peru from Israel, presented by Renat, and her coach is Josh. So, with that, I talked way too much. You won't be hearing me all the time uh, that much anymore uh, today. Uh, I wanna start with presenting all the pitch coaches. And I was looking at my presentation, so now I see you for the first time. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Um, I wanna go from Hello. the right side of the poster to the left. Uh, the last one that was added was Anoop. So Anoop, um, I'd like to ask you uh, three different questions. First of all, can you, of course, introduce who you are, uh, what your fund does, uh, what your focus is? And thirdly, can you say what you will look most for in a good pitch today? What do you think is important that all the founders keep in mind? Right, thanks Robin, and um, a big hi to everyone who's attending this webinar, including the uh, panelists, and uh, best wishes uh, to you, Robin and team on Startup Buddy. So um, I represent uh, Orias Venture Partners. We are an early stage venture capital fund, which is based out of India. We are focused on the Indian market. We are uh, tech focused. So we invest in companies that are essentially tech driven or tech enabled. We are sector agnostic. Uh, so we go across FinTech, consumer marketplaces, education, health, uh, literally across the spectrum. We've been lucky to be associated with a few unicorns. Uh, so Ola, Druva, uh, 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 soon to be a unicorn, Farm Easy, uh, Go Mechanic, Country Delight, Beto. Uh, these are some of the companies uh, from our portfolios uh, from the past funds and current fund. And um, yeah, we love working uh, with uh, startup founders. We call them misfits because generally when they come up with an idea, uh, everyone thinks that they're a little crazy. So we think that we um, love such misfits and uh, we would love to hear from them. On today's uh, session, uh, what I would look for as an investor would be clarity of thought that comes out in communication that is measured. Uh, it's a short period of time that one gets to pitch in such a forum. So uh, basically, if you're covering five or six points, which is what do you do? Why do you do that? Who do you do it for? and uh, what makes you think that you're gonna succeed versus competition and hence what's your moat and uh, what's the roadmap and what are you raising money for? Where is it gonna take you? I think these are some of the points. Uh, if they're covered well, uh, then that'll make for a great pitch. So look forward to today. Great. Thanks Robin, back to you. Thank you very much Anu. Um, so next we're going to Sagar Tandon from Moonshot Ventures. Uh, Sagar, can you uh, again introduce yourself and your fund 
And the first question, the third question that I like to ask you, what is the best pitch that you've ever heard? And uh -huh. can you explain why you thought that was the best one? Okay, okay. Uh, so I'm Sagar, uh, founding member of Moonshot Ventures. Uh, we are a first time fund and emerging fund that has recently formed in Indonesia. Uh, we are 100% focused on doing investments in Indonesia at this moment. Um, also, we have launched our, another fund which will be focusing on women entrepreneurs. Uh, we call it Indonesia Women Empowerment Fund. Uh, as like Oreos, uh, we are also sector agnostic. We look for tech for scale businesses uh, serving mass market. So we don't want to look at anything which doesn't touch uh, the next 100 million people in Indonesia. That's uh, basically quickly about us. Uh, the best pitch that I have heard, I won't take the name, but what I have seen, which I really enjoy in a pitch is around the storytelling and the narrative piece and how well the narrative and the storytelling is connected with the data that they are trying to present, whether in terms of the market size, whether in terms of the business performance. So connecting that data with the narrative really excites me. And I have seen multiple pitches on that. And that's what I will be focusing on today as well. How well an entrepreneur actually connects the narrative with the data. Uh, the other things that I would like to see is clarity of thought in terms of business model. Uh, maybe it's not there 100%, maybe the whole business model is not big, but the clarity how it can come in the future also uh, gives the confidence uh, how entrepreneur can scale and build it. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Shalom, Josh. Um, you're in the next stop. Welcome uh, for, and thank you for joining. Um, again, the same questions. Can you please introduce yourself? And the third question that I wanted to ask you, uh, Israel is really well known for being one of the hotbeds of uh, the startup uh, world across the planet. Um, do you know if there's anything in particular that's happening in, in Israel that you think we could replicate in Singapore and Southeast Asia to learn from? Sure. Uh, so I'm Josh Leggett. I'm on the investments team at our crowd. Uh, we're Israel's most active investor. We have offices all over the world, uh, over 1.4 billion in commitments and funding frameworks, 200 portfolio companies. We do, we've do. we done, created or invested in 22 fund of funds. We've had 40 exits. Uh, you know, we've gone to companies uh, early like Biocatch, which is, uh, not sure if you know about it because it's an Israeli darling, but an amazing company there, uh, as well as big companies like Lemonade um, and uh, as well as uh, Beyond Meat. Um, we're agnostic, sector agnostic, stage agnostic, check agnostic even to that extent uh, because of our model of having, allowing any investor, any credit investor to invest through our platform. Uh, so basically we create every deal as its own fund essentially. Um, what I'm looking for today um, or for any time when I speak to a founder is their ability to, you know, clarity is the issue, is, is definitely the big thing, but it's their ability to um, communicate what, you know, what is special? Um, you know, why this is so compelling, why I should be interested. Um, for them to tell me, show me, you know, why I should be chasing after them and begging them to take my money. Um, and in terms of Israel, uh, I'll use a Hebrew word for you, which is chutzpah. Uh, it basically just means like going after stuff and not really caring. Uh, and it's something that's very strong to the overall entrepreneurial community. Uh, you know, when you have a, you know, Israelis are very good at saying, um, I don't care that Google is working on this. I don't care that Amazon's working on this. I don't care that a bank is working on it. I'm going to do it better. And not really caring about that and saying, I don't, I don't care. I'm just going to do it. And it's funny. Uh, <laughs> you, and you laugh and you're like, okay, great. That's cute. But that's the entrepreneurial spirit. And that's why Israel is called Startup Nation is because everybody just doesn't care. And they just will be plow forward and try to create amazing technology. And that's why, you know, we have an unbelievable hotbed of tech in Israel. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, then we continue to Will. Uh, the third question I wanted to ask you is the same as I actually just asked for 
to Josh, uh, not so much about Singapore, but about Sweden, because I know that you built your own initial company. Then don't, don't, don't do the Swedish thing, man. I'm from Norway, okay? So now so I'm serious. <laughs> Please. <laughs> How did I come up with Sweden? <laughs> I should have checked that first. <laughs> okay. It's a great country. So uh, then I'm going to change the question. Are you sorry that you turned an inf uh, into an investor and not an entrepreneur anymore? Okay, super. Thanks for being here. Sorry, we, 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 we love the Swedes very much um, in Norway. Um, so I work with Cocoon Capital. Uh, we are uh, early stage fund, seed fund, uh, quite sector agnostic, but it has to be B2B. So we look at B2B opportunities across Southeast Asia. Uh, we launched our first small fund in 2016. We launched our second fund two years after that. Um, I guess what's different with us is that we, we tend to, or we have to invest quite slowly. We can only do five, six deals a year. Um, and we try to leave a lot of time to actually work hands on with the portfolio. Um, what we've seen in the last few years is that we actually now tend to invest much more outside Singapore. We initially started to invest almost everything in Singapore. So that is really, really a good sign for how the region is developing. Um, so I, I co-founded Cocoon with Michael Blakey, who, who some, some of you know. Um, we, yeah, we, we typically take the lead role in the investment and, and, um, and so on. Uh, to your question, uh, if it's good, better to be an investor than an entrepreneur, if I regret that, no, I don't regret that. I think that, you know, I, I was lucky as an entrepreneur and I kind of promised myself probably never to be an entrepreneur again. Uh, so being an investor is the closest thing to be an, being an entrepreneur again, I guess, because I keep working with uh, lots of entrepreneurs and I meet hundreds of entrepreneurs like every year. So no, I actually enjoy this uh, quite, quite a bit. And it actually feels like being an entrepreneur, actually. You still work 24 hours a day as an investor in early stage, just as you do when, when you're an entrepreneur. So. so just a different side of the same coin. Yeah. Cool. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and then uh, last of the investors, uh, sorry, I don't see everybody all the time. Uh, Mauna from Seed Me Amar Ventures. Uh, again, can you introduce yourself? Um, and then my specific question is, um, everybody has been impacted recently one way or another by COVID-19. Uh, you specialize in uh, investing in Myanmar, which is one of the most developing countries in the world. Uh, I'm really curious to know if you have seen any companies or entrepreneurs or founders do something there that is totally different from what you've seen uh, anywhere else in terms of overcoming this crisis and that we can all learn from. Thank you. Question. Um, okay, so I joined uh, Seed Myanmar Ventures uh, just less than a year ago. I am still an entrepreneur, so unlike Will, I, I still uh, wear both hats. <laughs> uh, but I'm actually, um, uh, you know, enjoying working in, in the last uh, frontier uh, market, which is uh, Myanmar. And uh, uh, we, we have been investing in, uh, in, uh, in a great portfolio, in actually in most innovative uh, tech startups in Myanmar. And there aren't many, of course, uh, but the fund was, uh, was set up in 2017. So we've been able uh, to, to grab, uh, you know, uh, the best ones. Um, in terms of uh, COVID-19, the impact has been, of course, uh, quite uh, significant. Uh, like, uh, you know, around, for most countries around the region. Uh, in terms of what they did uh, really special, uh, well, uh, I think uh, the attitude was great. They were reached out very quickly uh, to our advisors, to, to all the investors, and they have put uh, in place uh, a very, very uh, efficient uh, scenario cost, uh, you know, to uh, to make it cost efficient and um, uh, basically a survival uh, plan. And that was, uh, I was very impressed by the way they have uh, reacted very, very quickly. Um, other than that, I don't know, I, what kind of ideas you're referring to in terms of special? I don't know, have, have any companies made like a total pivot because of because of the situation or... 
Well, of course, uh, there were uh, a few, uh, for example, we have a, a freelancer uh, platform and they have seen a surge in the use uh, of uh, uh, using the team uh, feature that they had launched just before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, that grew really fast because, uh, you know, of, of the change in the ecosystem and people uh, working remotely. Um, so there have been a few opportunities uh, that they could leverage. Uh, there are a few in, in logistics that have suffered, of course, uh, but of course they focus on helping on delivering masks, for example, and, and uh, helping, uh, you know, the, the most affected uh, in that sense, in Yangon especially. In mm. the okay. uh, thank you very much. Um, so that was the start of the program and the introduction of all the pitch coaches. Um, like I said, before we go to the pitches, uh, we first have a short talk about with Professor Bala. And again, I'm trying to find you on all my different screens. Hey, Robin, I can see you. Yes, there you are. Uh, you will tell me when to put up the poll and the floor is yours. Sure. Can I share my slide here on share screen? Is that possible? Yes. You should be able to. Okay, so... Robin, can you hear me and see my screen? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, thank you uh, Robin and thank you uh, to the crew of Startup Buddy. Uh, my name is Bala, Bala Vissa. I'm a professor of entrepreneurship at, uh, at NCIAD. Um, Will is an alum and I know him from before. I'm not sure if uh, I don't recognize the other faces, but um, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about uh, um, network, social capital and entrepreneurship uh, because there's a good chance that uh, I will end up collaborating with uh, Robin and his crew on some projects. So instead of talking in detail of what the collaboration is, I thought I'll just spend a few minutes. He's given me five minutes time to just talk a little bit on anything. So I thought, let me pitch the idea of entrepreneurship and networks. Um, as an academic, from my perspective, entrepreneurship process is very simple. All you need to do is spot a good opportunity and execute well on it, right? So. Uh, spotting a good opportunity, was, what does that mean? It means innovatively solving a thorny problem for a set of users. Of course, the big challenge is your access as entrepreneurs uh, to user problems and your alertness uh, to recognize user problems, right? Uh, what does execute well mean? Uh, it means moving from an idea in your head to some business with some revenues, a baby venture, which uh, the key challenge here is the low cost way to uh, evolve and develop your opportunity. Uh, and of course, once you have, uh, sorry, apologies for the dog who's somewhere here making a noise. Uh, so uh, what is the second big challenge in execution? Moving from an infant venture to viable business. Of course, your uh, profitable growth in a competitive context, going back to the many things that uh, the panelists spoke about, what's your moat and how we build it and so forth, right? So all of this needs resources which is where, uh, you know, networks comes in uh, because as an academic who studies this a lot, from my perspective, a foundational resource is the way entrepreneurs build and maintain relationships. Super important. Um, I like to actually, when I talk to my students, I give them the analogy of this beautiful building in Singapore, which uh, we all know what that is. It's the Marina Bay Sands, right? Uh, but then I was in Singapore for a long time, so I was there when it was being constructed. And it looks like this when it's being constructed, right? So when we see our unicorn businesses and ventures, we, this is what we really see is this one, uh, but then uh, rarely do we get an insight into the foundational elements that led to that beautiful structure being put up, right? So especially for you all as an entrepreneur, uh, networks matter a great deal because you're on your own. You don't have a big brand behind you. Although some of these investors on the panel, if they do invest, then you do have a big brand behind you. Right? Uh, so in order to break it a little bit more concrete for you, I thought I'll do a little bit of a test. Imagine you've been funded by somebody on this panel. You go and launch and start building your venture. Uh, maybe you've outsourced your uh, accounting and, and bookkeeping to somebody else outside. Happens all the time because you're not great at this stuff yourself. Um, you go and do all of this and then suddenly one fine Sunday 
afternoon, you get the niggling feeling that things are not well. Maybe the guy you have outsourced to is cheating, right? And you start working on the accounts and you spend a long time. And at three o'clock in the morning, you discover that you have a big hole in your bank account. Because the guy you outsource your stuff to is made off with the money, right? So imagine the situation has happened to you. Can happen, okay? Um, imagine the situation has happened to you. Uh, just write down how many people can you call when it's three o'clock in the morning uh, to bail you out of this really sticky situation because you've issued checks and those checks are going to bounce. Uh, you need to get a mon money in the bank, I know, let's say a quarter of a million dollars, okay? You need to get that money in the bank account. How many people can you call at three in the morning who can bail you out of a really sticky situation? They don't need to have the money themselves, but they need to be able to listen to you and not threaten to kill you, right? There was this famous movie that the guy says, you call me at three o'clock again, I'll find you and kill you. Obviously, you don't call such people. Who can you call? How many people can you call that will do their utmost to help you out of this sticky situation? And because we are in Asia, and I guess Israel is part of Asia, please don't include your parents or your in-laws, okay? Both. So think of people who are not your, your parents, your siblings, or your in-laws. And just think about how many people can you call when it's three o'clock in the morning, their time, and they will do their utmost to help you out of a really sticky situation. Um, so I, I can see that uh, Robin has already put the poll up. Uh, can I ask you to just respond to the poll, please? Okay, I think it should be done. I don't know, uh, Robin is. Uh, can you share the poll results? Did people? Okay. Yes, you should be okay. able to see it. Yeah, I can see the results. I think all of us can see the results, right? Uh, this is a very typical pattern. Um, where you have roughly speaking 80% less than five, right? Zero to two people is 40%, 42%. Three to five people is 38%. Uh, and then you have a long tail, right? So this is very common, very typical, right? Um, and in fact, I use this as an introduction in my class on entrepreneurial networks. And then I go into some detail on what you can do to become, to get more into the right tail rather than uh, stay in that uh, 80%, uh, which is less than five contacts. Uh, the reason I gave you this was just to tell you that stay tuned. Um, I'm working along with a bunch of other academics at Singapore Management University. We're working on some projects and we will end up partnering with Robin uh, at some point and we'll reach out to you. We need your help. Um, and then uh, we will also give you something in return, some academic insights. Um, so uh, that's all I have for you. I think I'm kind of almost, out. I'm, I am out of time. Uh, but wanted to thank Robin and, and the startup crew. Uh, thanks a lot, Robin, and I'll be in touch. I unfortunately can't stay for the rest of the event, but uh, good luck. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bala. Let me stop sharing my screen so you can get on with it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, uh, Everybody who's interested uh, in the research that's coming up, keep keep track of the email newsletters of the Startup Buddy in the next uh, one or two weeks. Uh, we'll be sharing uh, more information about that through that. Um, and with that, we're going to the main event, uh, the pitches for today. You can probably already see on your screen, the first company that is coming up is Connexus, and Abby will pitch it. Uh, Avi, you can take it away whenever you're ready. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, listening to uh, me on a on a Thursday evening. So I'm Abhishek from Kinexis, co-founder and CEO of this company. Uh, uh, and uh, I think, first of all, I want to start with what is my motivation behind doing this? Well, Kinexis is a medical device and digital healthcare company uh, uh, solving uh, recovery issues for musculoskeletal patients. And why I'm doing this is because my own father, I've seen him suffering from a musculoskeletal disorder for the last 20 years. And so with entrepreneurship, I wanted to do something that adds value to the society uh, uh, and people's lives rather than just, uh, you know, building a product and selling it. So that's my motivation. And so we're talking about uh, Kinexus being a digital healthcare and medical device company that enables 
personalized recovery for musculoskeletal patients using a combination of wearables, data analytics, and AI. We are looking at musculoskeletal disorders and injuries, which is a global health phenomenon. Currently, one in four adults experience frequent knee pain. One in two Americans are actually uh, living with a musculoskeletal disorder, and that's more than the combined total of cardiovascular and respiratory diseases combined. And 90% of all the sports injuries are at hip, knee, ankle, or foot. These are the four uh, lower limb joints. So these patients spent a cumulative of $34 billion recovering from these problems, right? And that's about 300 million people globally. And two and a half million people uh, basically undergo various kinds of surgeries, such as total knee replacement surgeries and, and, and ligament surgeries. And that's where we are focusing. We're focusing on those chronic patients recovering from these surgeries as a beachhead. Now, we, our mission is to basically drive outcomes for, for these patients using a combination of wearable data, electronic medical records, and test results to drive personalized recovery from the comfort of home, enable personalized and precise decision-making, clinical decision-making, and enable patient guidance and stimulation uh, to help the patients recover faster. Now, in this direction, we have brought out the Chemia Rehabilitation Kit, which comprises of a wearable sensor, a patient's mobile application, and a clinician's dashboard uh, to enable enhanced compliance uh, it, this product has built upon the fundamentals of excellent usability and non-intrusive form factor and proprietary sensing technology that provides continuous monitoring uh, to these patients. Uh, now, talking about technology, this sensing technology actually comes from a U.S. company and we have obtained a worldwide license to it. Now, that U.S. company has close to 20 patents already granted for this sensor technology. Besides, we have other intellectual property, uh, foreground intellectual property that we are developing in the form of patent, uh, copyrights and trademarks already filed and obtained, uh, and know-how, of course. Currently, we are doing six clinical projects with four different public hospitals covering close to 80% of Singapore's surgical market. Uh, that includes totally replacement patients, ACL patients, and healthy adults as well. Now, the traction that we've received so far, we are six months into generating recurring revenue for the company. Currently, last month revenue was close to $15,000, growing at 50% quarterly, and, and we'll be doubling our revenue by the end of the year. And uh, sorry, that, yeah, that's every two quarters. Wearables are the main driving force behind this revenue growth. We'll be at 30K MRR by the end of Q1 2021. Now, besides public hospitals, we have partnered with a large number of physio clinics and rehab centers, and we have a database of uh, 300, close to 300 rehab centers between Singapore and Australia that we want to supply our products to. And we are also agreements with large medical device companies, global medical device companies like J&J, &J, uh, Johnson & Johnson, and Depu Synthesis. Depu is the world's largest implant manufacturer uh, in terms of market share. And we are currently discussing a big data project with them, uh, which will comprise of data sets from uh, of, you know, more than 15,000 patients. How do we make money? Well, uh, we make money by supplying our products to businesses who like hospitals and physio clinics, who in turn supply them to patients. And, and basically the patients can uh, you know, rent it from them or buy it from them. We also have a B2C to B model in which patients getting the product directly from us basically are referred by us to our partner physio clinics and we also get a certain percentage of the therapy expenditure that they make in consuming therapy at these clinics. My team comprises of 10 driven full-time individuals with expertise across product fundraising, sales and marketing, uh, business development, quality systems and regulatory, UI, UX, etc. Now we are looking at serving uh, close to 4,000 patients by end of 2021. Uh, obtaining, of course, uh, ISO certification and regulatory approvals in due course and generate $150,000 monthly recurring revenue by Q1 2022. Thank you very much for listening to me today and I welcome your feedback and questions. Thank you very much, Avi. Um, then we go to the questions. Uh, the first question is for Sagar Tandon. Mm -hmm. mm. I was actually a bit curious on your business model. 
you mentioned that it's b2 b2 c and b2 c to b why not directly you're trying to sell it to clinicians because i realize you are having the variable sensor the data and the clinicians actually use that data it's not directly the patients so why you have not choosing a route where businesses or the hospital hospitals or physio clinics actually pay for that that's the b2b2c that, model okay so but in 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 that case also the customer is not paying is the business is paying uh so it works on a consignment basis so what we do is we supply a certain amount of inventory to each physio clinic or hospital that we are working with and uh, basically then when at the point when a patient gets the product that's when their insurance kicks in or out of pocket payment kicks mm-hmm. in the product and then we do a ref share with them basically so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so it's an additional uh cost to the patient in a way correct mm-hmm. or so, is it from the hospital correct very good question so it's not an additional cost to the patients because uh for one reason if especially for private market now we are looking at private and public segment so for the private segment actually insurance covers the physiotherapy and everything that goes into that physiotherapy so the the way it is built to the insurance companies is basically uh, let's say a outpatient session of 200 dollars for that session that include mm-hmm. cost of therapy and cost of the product right so that the mm-hmm. whole of uh, that that amount is covered now mm-hmm. that is for private now for public you have your basic basically your uh, you know hospital uh, assigns uh, you know a certain reimbursement ratio for yep, each, yep. Uh, outpatient visit uh, for physiotherapy so that's basically includes the cost of this patient, uh, this this product right for mm-hmm. so whatever they have out of pocket is is incrementally increased by a few dollars but that's pretty much it got it got it got it um who else from the fsr pitch coach just likes to ask a question i'm i'm curious uh i'm will um uh, yeah if i can ask um sorry i i kind of perhaps i was uh, uh zooming out but what problem are you actually solving that's number one. and number two, uh what is your sensor actually sensing is the is it the angle of, of the, the joints so that you can see how many times i move my joints or do you measure anything else thank you all right great thank you for the question so the problem that we are solving is in essence the recovery optimal recovery of the patients the time and the cost taken for that right so basically the direct gains that the patient sees the direct gain that the healthcare facility sees is in those two time and cost metrics right uh, what is the sensor sensing uh, the sensor is sensing four classes of data now the first class of data is basically uh, talking about session monitoring that's when patients are actively using this product during at home rehab sessions or in the clinic rehab sessions now the second class of data is called continuous monitoring which is basically measuring the functional recovery of the patients uh, after surgery right on a continuous basis and reporting that to the clinician uh, that's, that's the angle of the joint the joint angle exactly so we have okay. joint angle right. we have gait we have cadence we have a, a whole bunch of lower limb metrics that we report to the clinician okay we have time for one more question yes i have one yeah. uh, this is mona here abhishek yeah. uh, great uh, presentation thank you you mentioned uh, about the monitoring uh, the continuous monitoring uh, software um and i i'm just wondering how long that continuous monitoring uh, is happening and what you're doing uh, with the data who is using that data and have you tested that already in patient trials great great question so continuous monitoring uh, technology is basically used for two things number one uh, we have patients who develop serious complications like joint stiffness infection uh, and 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 basically they if that is not addressed on time then they need to be readmitted there must be extended therapy that is needed you know i've seen cases where three months of therapy took actually nine months because of this problem right so so that increases again the the cost of, of healthcare for the patient to recover so so a continuous monitoring can pick up that and that's the ai we are developing and report that to the clinician so that the intervention can happen and that complication can be prevented from happening that's one uh, that's two, uh, the number two is basically talking about 
automated prescriptions, right? So we are working uh, on building the database that will enable us to build AI that can do prescriptions in an automated manner, right? So, so those are the two things that, that we are using the continuous monitoring data for. I hope I answered the question right. Yes, you did, Abhishek. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much, Abi. Uh, always a tough job to be the first pitch to kick off. Uh, I think you did a really good job. Um, let's go to the next pitch. Uh, Ivan, if you can start sharing your screen and make sure you're ready. In the meantime, we're going to do a small poll again. This is just for fun, no serious intent whatsoever. Uh, and we're going to do that in between all of the pitches so that the founders have a little bit of time to prepare themselves. So the question is, uh, who do you consider to be the best entrepreneur? And I've come up with random names. Thank you for listening to me. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. You can start sharing uh, in the meantime, Ivan. Sorry, there, there are two Ivan. You can you? Oh, okay. okay. Now you're on the screen. Uh, okay. Screen. okay. Everybody can see my screen. Ready? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, but just a second. Okay. So okay. I'll end the poll. Uh, and the winner is not entirely unexpected. <laughs> uh, probably because he's got the biggest Twitter account in the world, I think. But uh, Elon Musk. Okay. Um, Ivan, if you're ready for it, then you can start pitching. Okay, Robin. Uh, first of all, Robin, thank you for organizing. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, I will try to make the pitch as enjoyable and as concise as possible. So what is Wishlist? Wishlist is actually an online luxury department store. Uh, I started the business is because I would like to change the paradigm uh, that luxury has to be is expensive, uh, but not true, but it can be also be affordable at the same time. The problem in Indonesia is that three problems. First one is the safety issue. Indonesia burglary rate is 17.7 .7 out of 100,000. So with 260 million people in Indonesia, is there is 46,000 cases. And as you know, Indonesia is geographically dispersed. Logistics costs 10 times more in Indonesia than in United States. Uh, we, we, are, we are spending 30 cents on a dollar, whereas in, in the States it's only three cents. And when people think of Jakarta, they think of traffic all the time. On average, they spend about 400 hours. It could be more, I think. And the solution is that we provide uh, safety measures uh, to customers and we streamline the industrial supply chain and we make it accessible uh, by uh, offering them 24-7 services. Uh, the website is open 24-7. It caters to work uh, nationwide and seven days a week, and we make it very convenient. Um, what is Wishlist, actually? It's established in 2017. We consist of 12 people, four creative people, three engineers, two finance, and one digital marketing. We have 10 onboarded merchants and with more than 1,000 SKUs. Our historical performance, we have outperformed competitor on our second year. And on our second year growth is 15X, on our third year is 3X. Our strength is to have trusted brands only. Uh, we have a reliable platform, strong supply and order fulfillment. And since we have been in the market for some time, we have a strong market penetration. Uh, the top management is consists of me as a CEO. I am Ohio State graduate and I take executive education at uh, Columbia and also I'm in, I am in the precious metals and uh, jewelry for uh, the past 10 years and CTO is uh, my partner Ikin is a Berkeley graduate and he has a software house who employs 200 more developers and these are are some of our notable merchants and the market trend is becoming popular uh, not only among millennials but also among younger, younger generations and amidst the financial political uncertainty, 
investing in precious metals such as jewelry could be a promising tool for the moment. And the market size in Indonesia, uh, the whole market size in the world is $278 billion, which Indonesia placed third uh, worldwide with $10.1 billion. And I will get right into the number. Uh, when I started the business, uh, I was being called lunatic to even sell jewelry online, but I have proven otherwise by showing performance and tractions. Uh, as of 18, we have secured 200,000, 19, 600,000. And in terms of gross margin, we have secured 20% uh, gross. On average basket size, they spend about $185. Conversion rate is at 1.2%. Cost per revenue is at 7%. So it means that on $7, we generate $100. And cake is $0.08 cents per customer. And lifetime value is at 35 which is, I think, is the healthy number. And return on ad spend is at uh, 8x. So we have 100K users per month. Uh, these are uh, uh, some of the various marketing tools that we've been using at Wishlist. Uh, SEO, SEM, web push, uh, growth management platform, uh, and etc. And we are quite also active at social media. And at today, I am raising one million dollar uh, for purposes such as technology, human capital, marketing, and operations. I will go uh, one minute on the uh, technology. I think thirty percent will go to the technology. And I think this is some of the highlights that we would like to develop in the future: is to have a micro website in the website, and secondly, to build own ring. And this is our uh, exit roadmap. Uh, we are ready to exit by 2023. And some of our future plan uh, going forward. And why invest in Wishlist? Merely on six uh, big reasons. We have large market size, healthy gross margin 20%, low operating costs, higher uh, lifetime value, competitive insulation, and we have an experienced balance and align management team. Thank you. I hope. Uh, Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Ivan. And uh, nice that you put in that last slide. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I want to give the floor first to Will to ask the first okay. question, please. Yeah, hey, that was a really good presentation. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. I tried to make it um, you made as, it. It <laughs> in five minutes. <laughs> uh, you, you actually presented the problem really well for us that don't know potentially that market and that industry. Um, and you also really explain <clears throat> what you do differently. Um, I guess I only have one question, Robin, right? Um, yeah, you can ask two, two or something as well. Okay, so uh, let me ask two questions. First of all, <clears throat> how, do you, how do you build trust in your website? <clears throat> because I, I would guess that your products can be quite expensive. You didn't really say, I think, how expensive they were, but, but how do you build trust that I would actually take the chance to order through your website? Uh, the okay. second question is, if you have such a high margin, and since you are more of a platform than than a than a merchant, why do you not, why do people go through you and not directly to the merchants? If we talk about twenty percent, that's quite a lot of money, and they might be able to provide you know the same diamond cheaper. Right? Okay, okay, okay. I'll uh, answer the first question. Mm -hmm. uh, to gain trust, it's always been the reputation. I think uh, first one is delivery. We always get things delivered, and we always take testimonial from the customers. And we are also developing an O2O systems in the future, whereby customers, they can have a pickup point in our offline stores, in some of the offline stores. And second one, in terms of margin, as we would, I would say that we are a niche market, so only brands, uh, and also I'm providing uh, not only just the platform, but a more extended service such as uh, digital marketing support and that way I can charge more margin to the merchants and secondly is that uh, for merchants we give them freedom to spend more on advertisement so uh, then we take a management fee out of the uh, out of the cost yes I hope it answers your question. Also, oh, they pay you extra in addition to the 20% and you take a management fee for that. Yes, that is correct. Wow, okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. 
Hey, Ivan. Uh, I actually have been looking in this space um, okay. for a while. Uh, it's something that we've we've been tracking for a while. But one one of the areas that we looked on was the um, the P two P issue. Uh, is that something that you're looking into at any point, or are you strictly going to be just the consolidator of brands that want to sell, you know, directly at, at at sort of one spot, as opposed to going themselves, you know, through Shopify or Amazon or something like that? Right. I understand. Uh, well, in the short term, the answers would be no. I think we would like to focus more on the merchants uh, level. But in the long term, as you probably know that gold itself is a currency, we could also monetize the product into a P2P lending by doing a transactions online and by uh, uh, financing and and as good as the underlying, we could take a look into that uh, in the future. Cool. Mm. Do we have time for another question, Rob? Okay. Hi, Ivan. This is Anoop. Uh, I wasn't okay. sure that you had time for another question. Great presentation. Sure. Uh, you also happen to display that India seems to consume a lot of gold, which is actually true. Uh, mm. <laughs> now, um, the purpose of your website is to sell jewelry because someone at the other end is going to wear it and flash it in their place of work or at social gatherings, or is it that they are buying uh, also for the underlying asset value because you've been mentioning it a few times so i wonder what is the what is the insight over here that you're targeting are you are you are you also selling basic gold uh for people who want to acquire it for financial reasons yes uh i know actually uh our 20 percent of the total sales is compromised uh comprised of selling gold bars also for investment purposes uh, on the other uh, large part of our products, we are selling jewelry. As you know that in Indonesia, uh, jewelry can be also used as a leverage of investment as a wearable uh, items. So I think also uh, buying jewelry in Indonesia, I'm sure that like in India, it's like a culture also. So yeah. that way could be also a symbol of investment at the same time. Mm. Understand. Understand, and you're bringing in some thing of a, a tech, which you're calling it AR, but which is going to come down the yes. line, which is going to make uh, that's going to be a moat around attracting yes. consumers to yes. try products without actually having yes. to visit yes. a store. Yes, actually, I, I wanted to go over uh, the AR, but I didn't have time. But I will uh, go briefly. Actually, uh, also the pain point for shoppers is to visualize the uh, products. Uh, because uh, they they bought uh, but not as expected. But using AR, they can visualize uh, how's the jewelry look on my finger, how's the, how's the jewelry look on my uh, neck, for instance. Uh, that way, we could also uh, give solutions to the uh, pain point of uh, shoppers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um... Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, very nice presentation. I think you still had to work a lot since um, Monday, but I worked yeah. that well. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you, everybody, for your questions. We're now going to uh, a little break of the regular pitches, and we're going to Erich from uh, Kohive. Uh, Eric, you want to use my slides, right? Okay. You're still... Hi, Erwin. We are getting there. So, sorry. Thanks for to upload the file. Hi, everyone. Good evening from Jakarta. It was a bit well. Uh, I'm Eric, the CEO of the company from Cohive. We are the co-working industry and uh, community platform. So, later we'll file, uh, release the slide. Just some... Is anyone can see the slide already? Um, I think they're coming up. 
Oke. Okay. Sorry, here a bit. Okay, langsung ke next. Is it okay now, Robin? You can see? Or it's still not up? At the moment, I only see a black, a black slide. Maybe you have to click for the next one. Already, yeah. Sorry for the trouble. Sorry, guys. Belum di share screen. Belum di share screen. Bukan dari sini. Otherwise, I also have your slides. Okay, let me... One second. One second. I think everybody by now is used to this procedure, so don't, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. So when I use your probably, Robin, so I think my yeah, sure. apply is a bit, some connection here. Sorry, everyone, for the uh, hold up. So yeah, okay, don't worry. Stop sharing aja. Stop sharing aja. Okay, it's out, right? Okay, so uh, you can go for the next slide, probably, Robin. Thank you. So we are actually uh, number one uh, co-working industry in Indonesia. We are currently located at 30 locations uh, across uh, Jakarta, Tangerang, uh, Jogja, Medan, and Surabaya. We have uh, more than 10,000 members now. And also uh, from all events that we host is already more than 40,000 attendees. And the site itself, we run about 60,000 square meter plus uh, across the location I mentioned earlier. So we're also acquiring one uh, independence building that we operate, as well as where there's another product that we run is the uh, co-living and then also uh, co-retails. Uh, can go next, Robin, please. So at the moment, uh, we are giving a space for startup and also for the company that required uh, space to grow, or even currently because of COVID, some company are downsizing actually instead of uh, expanding. As well as we are providing very flexible in terms of payment. Uh, they have a flexibility not to put any deposit or upfront payment, basically. Uh, we are giving a flexibility for company to have a satellite office or rep office, basically, in other location across the city that we have. Because uh, we have now about more than uh, 10,000 members plus almost 1,000 companies uh, as our member. Yeah, we'll go next to so this is one of the sample of list of our member. We have Reborn, Stanley Hub, and other company that required specific design that we built for them because we have team from project team and also design interior as well as the operational team. We provide even space, meeting room, and on retail, we have also several tenants that opening their uh, business from F&B to uh, services and also uh, convenience stores. We are providing basically as a co-working, a co-working desk, private office, uh, meeting room, and uh, as our member, they have a flexibility to have a special deal on getting our uh, co-living product. You can go for next. So this is another company that asks for special design. Yeah. Uh, we have Facebook, Alami, uh, Sinhan, Future Labs, uh, and also Reborns. They're specifically talking to us, we design it based on the size, the need, the capacity of people. So it's, it's uh, not solely followed to the co-working concept, but it's catered to their needs. Thanks. And this is the activity. Uh, we are numbers of community events that we are uh, providing. Earlier mentioned 40,000 participants across the events uh, location we did. And also we have marquee events uh, that we host uh, regularly with our uh, members, our community, and also inviting some VC as well when we are uh, having uh, meetups with the founders or CEO of our members, as well as our partners. They, they, are, they are helping and providing some services in order to create a collaboration and event together. Next. So this is the team. So uh, us here, uh, Jason and Ethan is our co-founder. Myself and Iris is uh, on the operation and marketing. And we are also uh, supported by our uh, funding company, right, as uh, investors on the list buttons. So that's us and thank you. So I guess uh, later we, can, uh, we will share you some uh, free uh, membership 
to join our facility to try our membership for one month in uh, co-working uh, and later probably uh, our team will, will, will go into that. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Robin, once again. And thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Eric, for uh, uh, first of all supporting uh, the demo day today and for mm -hmm. uh, working with us. Uh, I, I really hope to visit your location when we're yeah, able to fly out to of it. Singapore yeah. again. <laughs> yeah, look forward. Yeah. Okay. Um, with that, we go back to the pitches. <clears throat> uh, in the meantime, I will pull up a quick poll again. Um, and the next pitch will be, sorry, uh, I had to do that um, share screen, uh, will be higher place of, with Stuart. Uh, Stuart, if you can get ready to pitch and share your screen, then in the meantime, the question for the poll is, what is an invest most, investor mostly supposed to be to a founder? Okay, advisor, advisor seems to be the most popular. Nobody is saying boss, that's a good sign. So these are the results, <clears throat> sort, of, sort of equal advisor or mentor. Uh, when I was making the question, I wasn't sure if I should group them, then it would probably have been a lot more. Uh, thank you everyone. Um, I think Stuart is ready for the pitch. So Stuart, uh, you yes. can take it away. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. All right, so when job seekers apply for a job, um, this is what they get, nothing, right? That's why people would like to attend hiring events, career fairs like this. But the days of large scale career fairs are over thanks to uh, COVID-19. So who is affected the most? Mostly these are the universities, right? Uh, the campuses uh, where they need to expose their students. So here, NTU, NUS, SMUs, they are the top three universities in Singapore. And I think just, just like them, everybody, uh, every university around the world is facing the same challenge. But what exactly is a virtual career fair? So they go on and run virtual career fairs um, and the virtual career fairs look like this. So you have a list of uh, talks uh, for the day or for tomorrow. Um, and these virtual fairs are, no are normally, they last for about a week. So employers, uh, if they are online, you can have a chat with them, right? I mean, these virtual career fairs are, are really just a glorified job portal with live chat. And, uh, and nobody really needs uh, another job portal. So what we're doing here is to solve this problem, right? How do we bring these recruitment events, the career fairs, uh, be, to be more effective? So we are bringing hiring events online in a speed dating format. Right, I'll just quickly show you the experience of a candidate. So here you have an app, the, the customer, uh, the, the candidate or the student will download the app. And once they have downloaded, they can see all the events that they're invited for. So if you are NUS, you'll be invited for NUS events, right? If you are from another university, you can also attend different events. All events are thematic. So it's no longer a career fair where everybody can come, right? We are going to the opposite of the direction of a career fair. Not a fair, not a job fair. It's a micro hiring event. It's a subcategory that we have created. So all events that is organized is targeted, targeted to a role, targeted to the, the students, um, targeted to the industry. And then we also have the fact that these events are invite only, right? You can't join if you're not an NUS student, you can't join, you need, you need to be filtered by the event organizer. And these events are very important, are short run, because nobody has time for a full day career fair, a week career fair, right? This must be hiring manager friendly. Candidate can interview anywhere, right? Whichever island they are on, on, uh, on in, in Indonesia, they can do the interview. So 
Right. So once you go into the event, say full stack developer, you can actually see the roles, right? So so this is one of the roles, and then you see that you know you're interested in uh, to to talk to Singtel, who is a, a telco in Singapore. You click on join queue. You will get a timer, right? It'll tell you exactly when is your turn to talk to someone, right? That's the whole idea. You get to talk to someone when you are invited to an event. You are guaranteed an interview compared to nothingness when you apply for a job. So what? So in, the time is up. You talk to the uh, hiring manager. Five minutes. You know, it could be five minutes, ten minutes. You know, whichever that the event organizer sets, and that's done. So on the interviewer side or the employer side, they it's like a Google meeting or a Zoom meeting, right? They get an invite, they click on that, right? There'll be a timer countdown. You'll be able to see uh, the profile of the candidate, um, and then after that, do a review, right? It's very simple. So in terms of traction, you know, we've been doing development since 2019 June, and we don't know that COVID was going to come, right? Um, and so far. Up till uh, June, end of June, we have run over 500 speed interviews. Just Tuesday, we have already ran 55 speed interviews for one event organizer. So here, um, because of COVID, you know, we had to run our uh, first first event actually during April Fool, um, and after that, Circuit Breaker came. You know, basically everything just you know. Everybody just wanted to do some virtual interviews. Um, in Singapore, we, have helping, we are helping E2I, Workforce Singapore, um, some universities to run their events. You know, we have participation from Center Charter, Cap Gemini. In Asia, we have uh, Geek Hunter, who is actually a recruiter in, 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 in Asia, tag, targeting tech roles. And these are some of the companies that have uh, participated. So uh, today, we just had a, a press release uh, in, in E227. You can check it out. Um, students really like it. The fact that you know they see that you know they, they get to speak to the hiring manager and not just the CV. Um, they really love this kind of initiative, right? In terms of market size, we are looking at you know if you look at just the the, the, the amount, sorry, the amount of uh, students in terms of this this uh, uh, market. This is fifty million. Um, and if I look at US, you know, there is a company that targets only students. They have a 25, 275 million valuation, which is what we're trying to, to be, the, the handshake of Asia. Okay, business model, very simple. For universities or uh, companies that have a lot of uh, candidates to interview, they can pay us for credit to run their own events. We charge on an hourly basis. So they, just, they pay 20 hours. They can run event for one hour, two hours, three hours up to them. And the other side is that we can run, uh, we work with event organizers like Geek Hunter. They run events and they charge event uh, employers to attend those events, much like HackerX. So team, um, that's me. I'm, I focus in tech and product. And then we have uh, Xiao Tong who is in, uh, who's actually a HR uh, person. So we are raising uh, 500,000 today. Um, thank you for listening. Okay. Thank you very much, <clears throat> uh, Stuart. Um, we're going to the questions again. I saw a lot of change, by the way, between the pitch from yesterday and today. Really good done. Well done. Uh, Mona, can you please ask the first question? Yes. Um, uh, thank you, Stuart, for the presentation. Uh, so you mentioned that you have uh, started in April 2020 and you run 500 speed interviews so far. Uh, uh, how much revenue have you generated? Uh, from that? So because we are early stage and in order for these companies to regain trust, we actually let them use for free first. Right, so because E2I, WSG, they are huge companies uh, in, in Singapore. So we let them use for free and right now we are charging, starting to charge, just started to charge only. So we have been pre-revenue before this. Uh, I may have missed a slide or two, but what is the projection so far that you have over the next 12 months in terms of... Uh, um, I didn't have a slide on projection. It, it wasn't in this, in this deck. Uh, we are looking at about uh, uh, 300,000 for the next 12 months. And uh, if you could just briefly take me through how you would get to those 300,000 uh, interviews, just really briefly, not, not in detailed way. Yeah, so um, there are about 4,000 universities in, uh, in Asia, right? Uh, so one of our approach is really to help the universities expose their, their students, right? Uh, I mean, if, if, we, if we look at our, our website right now uh, on speedinterview.me, uh, we have SUTD running like about 10 events already, 
right? So, so you know, we charge them on hourly uh, whenever they run the events. So we, we go to the university, say this is this is a better way for you to run uh, the career fest, right? To complement the career fest and more tactical. Right, so that's that's uh, what what we are trying to do. First, with the with the universities, and second, with companies like DBS, Standard Chartered, where they have tons of people to interview. Right, even after all the shortlisting and assessment and tools, you have 20, 30 people to interview. How do you do it? Right, so we give them the tool to do speed interview for for these candidates as well. Okay, thanks. Uh, who else likes to? I got, a, I got a quick one. Um, you mentioned that you're doing pre-screening, um, you know, before people come in. Can you sort of touch on that, what exactly that entails? Okay, so our event, our platform is like the event bride for speed interviews. So anybody can actually create their own events, speed interview events. Um, and the filtering is actually done by the event organizers themselves. So if Dick Hunter... For example, the recruiter, they, don't, they do their own filtering. E2I, WSG, they do their own filtering. We just provide a platform for them to do so. So what, what could they, how could they filter? Is it by major? Can it get uh, creative using things that you're providing? Or is it just like a simple Excel, you know, like some way to Excel filter? So it really depends. Um, some, some, some of them, they have, have their own ATS. So they, they onboard their candidates. And once they, you know, some, some are using some AI tools to, to identify which candidates are suitable and then only bring the shortlisted candidates into the interview itself. For us, um, we are planning to actually have uh, a workflow where we can say, okay, you want to uh, integrate with, let's say, Adaphase or uh, uh, another assessment tool, then you can, right? So and then once you shortlist those candidates, those candidates will be invited to the events. Uh, we you. have... Time for one more question. Sorry. Can I quickly ask? Yep. Um, it was a good presentation. I'm just curious a little bit about your positioning in the whole HR tech market because it's a pretty crowded market in its own self. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of companies which run hackathons for coders to actually get selected. So can you actually talk a little bit about your competitive mode and the other existing companies in the whole, whole landscape? That's that's a good point. You know, when we started, we wanted to be the 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 alternative uh, app compared to a job portal, right? So students just come in here, get into an event, get a job instead of going to a job portal and get a job, right? So you know, as you said, it's very competitive. So instead, we are actually going into the direction of targeting the universities. So we become, uh, we provide the platform for the universities um, and also companies when they actually want to do a uh, speed interview. So it could be a mix of um, an interviewing tool, right? That, that is the, the, the direction. But at least that is the beginning. That is where we are going as our beach head. Mm -hmm. But isn't it like the other companies can easily pivot it and also go to the universities? Like what's your competitive edge over existing platforms to existing the market. Yeah, so I think the interview tool is not difficult. What's difficult is the queue, queue management, right? Because you have a live event, you know, uh, there's a lot of connections into an event. Um, and then you need to make sure that, you know, the, the, the interview time is, is, is boxed and the next person comes in and what if the next person miss his turn? All right, so it's, it's, it's not so straightforward because we have the queue management system to make sure that we honor the time given to the, to the candidate, which is like 10 minutes, 20 minutes, not turn-based. And also we honor the time that we have been, uh, we have, we, we, the employer have uh, allocated. One hour means one hour. They cannot mm -hmm. have anybody else queuing for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Thank the queue management, thanks. Yep. Thank you very much, Stuart, uh, for yet another good uh, pitch. Um, next one up is uh, Rinat. Uh, take your time to prepare a little bit. In the meantime, we have a short poll again. This is a very uh, nasty question. I was just really curious what's, what the result was going to be. If you knew 100% for sure your startup would fail, would you start? I'd say that's a pretty darn question. It's a good <laughs> question. Yeah, really good one. Okay, I see Renat is uh, 
more or less ready. So I'm going to close the poll and share the results. Uh, <laughs> I did not expect that. <laughs> so, uh, wow. I, will, <laughs> I will explain why I asked the question. Uh, most of you are probably aware of the statistic that 90% of startups fail. And nevertheless, apparently every second free companies start. Uh, so that 10% extra of certainty still will make half of you start a company. Really good. Um, with that, let's go to Rinat. Rinat, uh, when you're ready, uh, you can take it away. Okay, uh, great. Thank you very much, Robin. Thank you all for joining uh, this session. My name is Rinat and we are Peru and we are upgrading business communication channels. Well, the problem that we see in the market today is that companies rely on outdated enterprise system in order to connect with their existing customer base. If they want to deliver mass messaging to their existing clients, they have two channels, email or SMS. As we all know, email rates are down. We have an open rate of only 34% and the CTR, this is what's really important. When people actually press the link, it's down to a measly 3%. And while SMS delivery rates are 98%, nobody actually, uh, well, get a net, uh, notices SMS anymore. And by all means, their CTR are extremely low as well. So what we are meaning is that engagement is down, sales are down, while prices always, always go up. But what if your company could engage their existing audience with an uh, open rate of 70%. This is exactly what we are doing here right in Peru. We are offering direct marketing communication channels using instant messaging, successfully managing to increase exposure and engagement to over more than 70% to increase sales, but up to 13% while still being affordable using a CTR business model. So let's see how Peru actually works. So this is our amazing, really easy platform. When you see here, it's a list of customers you can import it with um, almost every one of your application through an Excel. And then you can filter it by birthday, age range, gender, city, status, or if you have massive, massive campaign using tags. All you have to do is go to the add button, and if you're using Telegram, just create a new campaign, just enter your title, description, your link, and of course, a picture, a GIF, or any kind of video to make it even more um, engageable. And if you're using WhatsApp, all you have to do is to select a pre-approved uh, pre uh, um, template from our own base. This is one in Hebrew of our first customer, which is Ellen Carr, the quitting smoking uh, company. And then you as a company will receive an instant message with the customer name, phone number, what it wrote, and a direct link to start an instant chat and cross fingers, of course, close the deal. So just a second here. Great. So the application to mark the, the application to person market size is a whopping $51 billion. And the instant messaging market, well, the numbers aren't quite clear because it's a brand new market. But we do know that we have 4,150 million instant messaging accounts. And in a few years, we are planning to have a $150 million sharing market in order to our business plan. And our business model is quite simple. We have three options, whether it's marketing by your CTR or better by notification, or one of our best, I think, business model with having hot leads and leads generation option. Our competition, we are going to fight the big boys in the neighborhood. Uh, MailChimp, which is the mailing list leader, and Jukes SMS is the bulk SMS leader. Both of them have lower open rate and CTR than we have, and they're much more expensive. We have done five POC with an open rate of 75% and a CTR of between 20 and 29% with a purchase rate of 30%. Our first customer, Ellen Carr, has an open rate of 98% and a CTR of 36% and while still maintaining a purchase rate of 13%. 
Well, we have done a lot from October last year. We now have a strategic partner with Compass Plus, which is an amazing Eastern European uh, uh, payment, uh, uh, payment application company and our first paying customer, LNK. We are still pre-revenue, um, uh, pre of course. And we have an amazing team. Ruven is a seasoned and experienced entrepreneur. He's our CEO. Alex has 15 years in uh, product management. Uh, Konstantin is our VP. He has a team in Ukraine, which, uh, which has all our needs during the production. This is why we are maintaining a really uh, um, fast pace in production. And myself, I am the uh, CMO, and we have Radislav, Dr. Radislav Weissman, who will be in charge of the, um, of the AI. So please contact us uh, whenever you can, whatever you want, we will be happy to uh, answer any one of your questions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really nice pitch again. Uh, thank you. Josh, can you start off the questions, please? Sure. Great pitch. Uh, also happy that, you know, the whole chutzpah thing I said at the beginning, when you put a big competitor next to it, it, you know, shows that uh, happy to see more Israeli entrepreneurs going after the big, you know, the big boys uh, and girls. Um, so Thank two you. quick questions. One is the, um, any, it's a pretty crowded space, as, as you said, you know, in the marketing tech space. Um, what IP, what differentiation uh, does your company have? And second of all, um, I saw on the side of the, uh, when you showed your dashboard, you know, you have a reports tab. Can you talk a little bit about the reports and the actual insights and the KPIs that you're providing to your customers? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the, uh, what, what makes it unique that we are a really, really small company. And we, what we can do is we can adjust to any customer that need our help. For instance, because we're really small, we can, for, uh, Compass Plus came to us and Ellen Carl came to us, we came to them and they had specific um, requests. So if we were a big company, we could just, okay, uh, our product isn't what you want, but what we can do is actually uh, adjust to them, have what they want, how to reach their audience. So we can move really, really quite fast uh, in order to have them what they need. Uh, the KPI that we are using is, uh, well, with Ellen Carr, which is our first customer, we are testing um, the time of the reply, uh, how many people have answered, uh, what was the, uh, um, of course, the, wh when they contact them, and of course, in the end, the purchase rate itself. But this is not something that we can control. This is the salesman of, uh, of course, from uh, Ellen Carr. A quick follow-up. So, so the personalization definitely see that as a, as a amazing thing to provide. How do you plan on maintaining that as you hopefully scale this thing to become a large company? Um, are you going to build? Is it something you're building? Is it just having a large sales team? Uh, you know, what's the strategy there? Well, the strategy with, that uh, we have already started is to contact uh, um, uh, marketing agencies advertising agencies and resellers. For instance, Compass Plus, they have, they have um, uh, I think like 100 customers of their own. They have another customers of their own. This is exactly the companies that we are looking for. So we can have our services to Compass Plus so they can uh, have them on their uh, service to, um, um, to cater to their customers' needs. So Compass Plus, for instance, is going to be a great, uh, uh, a great addition to us. This is exactly what we are looking for. Thanks. Great. Thanks, so I have a question. Uh, this was awesome. Uh, this is real. Um, I Thank just you. went to the website. I tried to sign up, but I can't sign up. Um, yeah, yeah. We are working on that. Uh, okay. Right uh, now. Second it's, question. It's going to be, it's, it's in yeah. the work right now. Okay. So at least I'm, I'm, I'm super interested. Um, if I have an SMB and I have lots of, lots of people in my email database, are you helping me to convert that into social media contacts? I'm not sure if you answered that in your presentation. Because most people no. would have a list of phone numbers, so they have you know database of email addresses. How do you convert it into being able to actually contact them on instant messaging? 
well, uh, it's not something that we do just yet. Um, what, we are, what we are doing is that, I mean, all their existing customers have signed uh, an agreement uh, that let them uh, deliver messages to them. So we take them the, those Excel sheets and then we just deliver it through uh, instant messaging, Telegram, and WhatsApp. And, okay, and so the future, computer, which they have, have the database or social media. Yeah, yeah, they have this. This, this is with existing clients, so right. it's not them, which is really important, and it's GDPR mm. compliance. Mm. And we are using um, the API from WhatsApp. So I think we're one of the first companies that have actually been uh, approved by uh, WhatsApp to send templates. Right. Okay, so that, that, then you can directly kind of convert a phone number into WhatsApp, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then you have to be GDPR compliant as well. Yes, we are. Oh. We are accompanied by one of the Israeli's biggest uh, lawyer companies, uh, Shibolet. I think Josh knows them. Oh, and right. uh, we are GD compliant, yes. Uh, it's really important. Right. Yeah, right. we invest in Israel. Oh, okay. We invest in Israel and... Uh, of course, uh, we have uh, all the security needed to secure those uh, people' uh, private details and everything that is uh, connected with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rina. That's the time uh, for, for now, but we're going to the Q&A anyway, so uh, if people have much. questions, they can do it there. Uh, for the next 15 minutes, uh, we're going to switch roles. Um, I'm going to uh, give over the floor to my colleague, Dr. Shafari Sati, and she's going to host the Q&A. Uh, everybody in the audience, if you have questions, please start sending them now, and Shafari will make sure that they get asked to the right question, uh, to the right person. Shafari, over to you. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, can you see me? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I'm Shafari. I'll be conducting the Q&A today. Um, I I would like to actually open the floor to uh, Anoop first. Uh, he's one of the investors who um, hasn't been directly connected with the founders uh, today. So uh, Anoop, do you have any questions for any of the four pitches? Yeah, so I asked um, a couple of questions uh, in the middle. Thank you, Shabri. Um, I wanted to ask Renat, um, uh, what, is, uh, what is the defensible moat over here in your solution, which is gonna help you win over the legacy players that everyone seems to be using and uh, not to forget that there is GMAS as well. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's a problem. We don't have, uh, I mean, we are planning to have uh, in the future an AI. Uh, everywhere, everything is built upon uh, big data in our company. Uh, so that is going to be our competitive advantage. We are planning uh, to, to have enough data to say, when is the best time for you to get, for instance, um, in uh, a, a WhatsApp, maybe it's eight o'clock in the morning, maybe it's eight o'clock in the evening. Uh, this is why we have Dr. Radislav uh, in our core team, which is an AI expert. But for now, uh, we don't have something that um, others can, can copy. We know that. Uh, this is why we are moving as fast as we can to, to have a bigger share of the market as we can possibly have. We know it's a risk, but you know, you gotta start somewhere. And for instance, MailChimp doesn't, doesn't have something uh, unique. They have an extremely uh, good platform and a great service. I know I use it. This is why they, I mean, four or five years ago, they weren't the, the, leader, the leader in the market, but they managed to get there. So this is our plan. And um, as I said earlier, we are moving through real, real um, uh, resellers and marketing agencies in order to make this uh, expansion as fast as we can. Thank you very much. I had a question Thank for uh, Abhishek from Connexus. Uh, the sensors that you, um, and hi, I, I think a teammate has also joined, so um, say hi to the, uh, her as well. Uh, the, uh, uh, the sensors that you have, the data, is that getting connected to the insurance company which is paying for the bills of the consumer? Um, how does it work? Is this a patient engagement platform that you're gonna sell as, on a SaaS basis on whatever, let's say $3 per person per month? Uh, how is it, how's it gonna work out? Correct, so with respect to, thank you for the question, that's a very pertinent question. Uh, first of all, uh, with insurance there are 
different kinds of place that are uh, you know integrated in 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 the way the uh, product is being rolled out in the market first of all uh, with respect to um, you know uh, we you've, you've probably heard about value based healthcare right wherein uh, the reimbursement is tied to the outcomes rather than like a set number or set amount of therapy that's given to the patient and then insurance reimburses say 10 sessions of physiotherapy after a total knee replacement surgery right and whether the patient actually recovers in those 10 sessions or doesn't recover in those 10 10 sessions insurance still has to pay for the entire 10 sessions so so that model is being disrupted with with this tool and this system right because now insurance companies actually have the data uh, which they can use to actually determine whether the patients have reached those outcomes they are supposed to reach in 10 10 sessions which is what they are paying for right so 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 that basically totally disrupts that whole uh, reimbursement uh, model that exists currently right especially in asia because value based healthcare is is at least to some level there in us but it's it's coming up in asia so that's number one number two itself is is around the design of incentives that the insurance company can do incorporate in their insurance plans and policies to differentiate their own insurance uh, from other insurance companies so we've been approached by a number of reinsurance companies and what they want to do essentially is basically design incentive mechanisms uh, in the system to uh, in the form of like lower premiums if the patient recovers within a set period of time using our system right because then it they 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 actually consume less amount of reimbursement uh, dollars uh, you know during the course of their recovery so so these are the two insurance plays that we are looking at uh, currently and 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 that's that's as far as our uh, interaction so far with insurance uh, uh, industry is concerned we're looking at more more models but then uh, you know in the future thank you very much so on the insurance piece i just want to have to uh, so is it something like insurance companies are approach you if your product is being used by the patient the patient can get a uh, better uh, premium plans uh, can get incentivized for certain things is it correct yeah so for example right like let me give you a very simple example right uh, a patient a standard patient recovers in let's say 12 sessions right and uh, uh, you know the the insurance policy that incorporates our system into it and enables the patient to recover faster basically uh, you know gives the 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 it's like sort of like how you buy your you know car insurance right uh, in in different countries right so if let's say you have no claim discount then you get like a 5% off right over your next renewal right with that company so so it's it's essentially that right except that instead of the car you have your knee here and and in, and you have your health insurance here so you get like a you know a, a small percentage of discount in your next renewal if you let's say uh, you know end up consuming less therapy dollars for this because you are using the system and and there is data around it mhm mm mhm mm So in a way, so do you think insurance companies are becoming your way to acquire new customers? Absolutely, and I let me tell you, let me state a fact here. I think since you've mentioned that uh, in the US, there is this company called Hinge Health, right? The Hinge Health has currently raised one hundred and twenty-six million dollars uh, to to basically solve the problem of lost productivity uh, by uh, US employers as a result of their employees suffering from various musculoskeletal conditions. now what that entails is the us economy on an average uh, air, uh, loses about 213 billion dollars uh, as a result of lost productivity due to uh, their employees suffering from musculoskeletal problems so their whole model is based around selling to insurance companies right and 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 yeah. the time off work. is it very similar to a company that i have observed from health iq which is invested by anderson horowitz so yeah get it good Okay, uh, I'm just going to step in so uh, we have time for uh, other questions. So one of the attendees has also asked a question. So Gayatri from Indonesia, um, she's asked. I'd, I'd like to direct this question to um, Wizless. She's asked a very generic question when it comes to entrepreneurship. So she asks, how many years of entrepreneurship experience have you had before you found your startup? Well, actually, um, I've been in the landscape for almost ten years already, and I founded Wishlist three years ago, uh, back at the beginning of two thousand seventeen. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and then uh, we have a question that's coming during the um, event as well. So I, I believe this is for higher place. Um, okay. So the question is, um, if the students are getting shortlisted by companies um, based on the portfolio, how is it solving the problem of uh, not getting any answers back when you apply for a position? Um, because the companies will shortlist only a few students. So only a few applicants get a response. Yeah, so uh, there the are two modes here. If let's say the universities are the one that's organizing the events, so it's actually targeted to a very specific group of students. So there's really no shortlisting needed. Um, but if we do, but we do have com companies that still want to shortlist based on resumes, um, although they, they really know that this is a, is, is a targeted group of students. Um, and when, when they do that, they can actually uh, favorite those students that they want to meet only. Right. Um, so, but at least you know the the process is um, less uh, rigid compared to a typical uh, job portal. Right. So, a job portal you might not even get to uh, the actual uh, interview. So, do these students get um, any suggested uh, positions that they should uh, go for, and, and based on their profiles? So the students are actually not the whole student of the campus. It's very specific. Let's say, for example, engineering students, right? So, and these are all engineering companies, right? So when they come, they will, they, there will be a list of uh, open positions that are meant for engineering students, uh, and they can pick and choose which one they like to, uh, to do the interview. Cool. Um, the next question I'd like to address is actually for our investors. Um, so the question is, um, uh, I'd actually like to uh, direct this question to um, Mona. Um, have you ever faced um, a startup to mentor fit that kind of a scenario? And how did you deal with that? Sorry, could you repeat the question? I couldn't hear you. Yes. So, so this question is from Dri Yek from Singapore. The okay. question is, uh, have you ever faced a uh, startup and mentor fit when it comes to dealing with a, a, a founder that you're working with? Uh, very good question. Um, founder mentor fit, right? Yes. Uh, yes. I mean, most of the time, I think I've, I've been quite lucky uh, meeting really great entrepreneurs um, and um, had very good, very good, um, you know, relationship uh, uh, with them. Um, I think there are a few cases where we had a few disappointments. Uh, I run a network of mentors as well. So this is the reason why we have a, a few data points there uh, and some learning. Uh, what we notice is that sometimes when there is a misfit, there is a um, uh, mismatch in expectations. So the, men, the, the founder is expecting uh, probably a, a um, a big amount of dedication in terms of time, uh, in terms of guidance, uh, and there is not much responsiveness also. For example, if you meet the mentor, there is no follow-up uh, email after that, or thank you email, or like a bullet point of the outcome of the conversation, uh, which will help remind uh, the mentor what had been discussed in the previous meeting. Right. Uh, so uh, generally, there is a little bit of a uh, the, some of the founders will expect that the mentors will make um, yeah, I, think, I think that's super valid um, it, it, the communication needs to be maintained from both sides um, and I completely agree with you that um, so the next question uh, I think this will be the last one because we're running short on time uh, is from Rahul Jha from Switzerland so he asked um, he asked, the, he asked actually the startups, I'd like to welcome any one of you to answer this. Uh, what is your scaling strategy for emerging countries? Um, who would like to answer that? Um, perhaps we can have um, Renat, can you answer that please? Well, we still, I'm sorry, but we still don't have an emer uh, uh, scaling to emergent, uh, a uh, company who is now emerging. Okay. Uh, we are setting out sites to Europe uh, at this moment. Ah, okay, okay. 
Um, then perhaps Ivan, you can answer this question. I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? Uh, what is the, what is your the, scaling strategy for emerging countries? Okay, I think uh, my strategy, uh, my product has to be simple. Uh, because I think in emerging countries, uh, uh, the technology usage is not as usually, uh, it's not as frequently used as in uh, emerging countries. So definitely simpleness and uh, definitely to the uh, solutions to the pain point. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I think that wraps up the Q&A for today. So um, we can now go back to the pitch coaches and have them give their feedback. Um, Robin, would you like to take over? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Shafri, for doing the Q&A. Uh, we're going back to the feedback round. Um, I haven't really introduced this at the start, uh, but our demo days are in a way a little bit different from a lot of other demo days that uh, we try to make this also a learning experience for the audience. So we have asked all the investor pitch coaches to keep track of the one company that they were linked to. And now we're gonna make a round to uh, ask all of you to give the founders a few tips back uh, about their pitch, about their company, anything that will probably help them in the future uh, build either a better company or do a better pitch or both. Um, and to start off, uh, I just wanna go back on the poster again. So, uh, i like to start off with uh, Mona. Can you first share what your feedback and tips are? Okay, to be fair, I didn't have enough time to make all the thinking, but so I, I will just give my uh, initial uh, feedback for Higher Place, correct? Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, so, Stuart, um, the, the pitch was, was great, but I wasn't uh, very clear on, on first on the, on the business uh, model. I think uh, that could be uh, a little bit more uh, detailed. Um, uh, also on the roadmap on how you're going to get to those 300,000 uh, uh, speed uh, interviews. Other than that, I really like how your competitive analysis on how uh, you are uh, making it clear that you are increasing the, the probability for the interview. So if you could manage, if, if you manage to uh, prove the concept, I think that would be um, a real game changer. Um, so that's all I have for Higher Place. Great. Thank you very much. Um, let's go to Will. You were connected to, let me check. This list. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, no, uh, I guess some feedback already. I think, you know, the presentation was great, as I said. I think um, what what could have been done even better, although it, it was a really good presentation, was to probably show us the homepage, talk a bit more about what products you're actually selling, um, what price points, what were your top three categories, because, you know, uh, I haven't seen your website before, and you might meet investors also that haven't seen your website and used it before. Um, the second thing that I was looking for was probably to understand a bit more on why you're racing. I think you're racing a million US. Um, why are you racing that money? For how long would that last you? Uh, how much more would you be able to make, sell, develop based on that million versus if you hadn't raced that? Because it sounds, sounds like your business is doing very well already. So that's always mm -hmm. important when you raise money, uh, I think for everyone to explain for how long will this be? I mean, in Cocoon, we always say you should race for the next 18 months if you're at the seed stage, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we always want to know exactly how you're going to spend that money. Um, okay. Otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, super interesting. Thank you. Um, I think I will answer it, the question separately um, out of the session to you. Yeah, please. Please do that. Super interesting. Thank you. Mm. Great. Thank you very much, Will. Um, then we go to Josh. Can you uh, share what you thought of Rinat's uh, pitch and what she can add on? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do, I'm going to change your question a little bit. I'm going to do some two general things also, but with Rinat specifically, first of all, great pitch. Like, really good, really clean, quick. Like, it didn't see, you were, you were, um, you didn't take a lot of time, but you it didn't seem like you tried to shove 
10 minutes of pitch into five minutes of time. Uh, you came out very good, very clean. Um, it's more not on the pitch because I think you did a great job explaining the business. It's more of the business going forward, which was a concern that I raised and a couple of the founders raised, which is that defensibility, that IP, that moat. And that's just trying to figure out where you're, it's such a big market, um, you know, that, uh, that I think that there's definitely space in there for a lot of different players, um, but you just have to find how you can cut that out for yourself. Um, can I give two general things or not really? Yes, or yes we, of course. Yeah, so the two general things for me is um, a lot of founders don't know this uh, for pitching is have more than one pitch deck. Um, a lot of founders don't just will have one. Um, you'll have, like, have multiple pitch decks. I think people had really good pitch decks for this session. But, uh, you know, decks that one deck you email, one deck for somebody who doesn't understand the problem. Like, for example, um, you know, with the – the medical company, I didn't really, I, I, even though I've had injuries, I don't really understand medical so much. So if you're going to agnostic fund, you may need to add in a couple uh, slides in there on education, um, you know, just on that fact. And then the second one is something that came up, which was, um, you know, talking about exits at the seed stage. Uh, I'm not a fan of that. That could be a pet peeve of mine because so much stuff could happen, you know, so just tell me all I care about is how you can get to the next stage of what the vision is going forward and not necessarily like, yeah, we're going to exit this thing in three years and everything's going to be great. You know, that's just a pet peeve of mine. Um, I don't know if other, the other investors on the call have thoughts on that, but that's just like, just tell us how you're going to get to the next stage and the stage after that. And, and cool. Like, and then, and have us think about, is this a big enough? Can we see this being big enough? And, you know, have you shown us that it can be big enough? Right. I kind of agree with you, Josh, on that. Yeah. Personally. Uh, thanks a lot, Josh. That's, Josh, that's good feedback. Uh, in, in the preparation, I told them, put this slide in and put this slide out. And then usually one of you is telling me that I was wrong and that you should have put it back. But that's how they it They were goes. all great. <laughs> They're all great. The presentations are really, really good. I've seen some awful presentations in my life. So these were all definitely mm -hmm. in the top quartile, I would say. Oh, great. Um, there. So really good job. But uh, it, it's more about when they're, you know, out in the world, you know, trying to pitch, you know, yeah. that, that sort of have, have, yeah, have like eight decks. Like, you know, I know people who have one deck, you know, a deck and then a second deck and then a deck in of like expanding upon each section of the deck <laughs> so they can pull it out. Like, and it looks great. You look so prepared when you're pitching and like, you're like, okay, drill into marketing. Sure. Drill into your total gross market. Sure. Here's a deck where I have four slides about my market. You look amazing you know it, it it looks really good and i've seen that a lot of times and it's always refreshing good one uh, a good tip for next time um let's move to sagar can you please uh, give your feedback to kinex yeah so i personally really like the presentation i like the whole flow of the presentation three things which stand out to me were a good narrative you started with your dad situation and then the very good clarity and the most important piece that I personally enjoyed listening to you was confidence. And the more questions that we asked, you had a good amount of confidence, I think, which definitely helped. Um, few things I would add, maybe you should talk about it and add into your presentation. As Josh also said, one, definitely a thing around simplicity and your problem statement. It was not very clear what's exactly your problem statement. And maybe to talk about your problem statement, you can actually compare the customer journey with existing ways of things happening. I think that's very important. And I think there you can work about a little bit. And the second piece is talk a bit more about your team also, which I felt was kind of missing. Um, the third thing I'll say on your business model side, I think you could have made it more exciting. To be honest, I'm just thinking like, multiple things and I think there is a huge opportunity, huge space and I don't think so. I felt it when I was looking at your business model. Great. Otherwise, amazing presentation. I, I'll say one of the uh, uh, good presentation I've ever seen. Nice. That's like a, a comment that you like to hear. <laughs> uh, and then last but not least, of course, uh, Anu, can you uh, give your feedback? Uh, can be generic or can be specific? It's up to you. Yes, yeah, so I think, um, uh, Robin, I've already um, uh, given my feedback in the form of uh, the questions that I ask because uh, normally you're left with these questions in your mind if 
the presentation is not hit home on the specific points. So I think the founders have already noted that. And uh, but overall, look, uh, uh, I think it was very well timed. Each one of you spoke with the right amount of pace. And uh, if you were reading uh, from something, we did not feel that you were reading from something, which is very good. So that means it was practiced and you were natural, uh, which is also very important. And uh, I think it's a good practice to write down your script for every slide uh, because in a, in a short time period that you've been given uh, in, a, in a non sort of physical interfacing scenario where you're not actually meeting a person, you don't have that opportunity to sort of, you know, lose their, lose their attention on a Zoom call. So it's important to uh, have some sort of a script ready and then play to that script and time yourself uh, do a recording of that. Uh, we've been doing that with some of our cohort companies that are going through our Misfits program, uh, and it's been incredibly useful. So play it back to yourself and see how you come across. Yeah, so that's also useful. Uh, but yes, I mean, no further, no further feedback, uh, Maureen. I, think Anu, most I just of the, want to step in and ask you yeah. a question. Um, do you think any of the investors will be contacting any of the founders of this today? I would, I would imagine that uh, there would be interest depending on, you know, the different uh, uh, fund have different mandates. So uh, it'll all be dependent on that. What do you have in your portfolio? What do you don't have? Which is the new market? Uh, and those, those could be interesting. I think uh, everyone's, uh, um, you know, sort of looking for their own uh, sort of pie in the sky uh, in that sense. So, yeah. To follow up on that question of uh, Sharvery, actually today uh, I was notified by a founder that pitched at our first demo day in February that they closed their rounds and that they found uh, two of their investors through our demo day. So that's a first success story for, for us, for my team, because in the end that's what we try to achieve with these demo days that uh, startup founders can find investors and grow their companies. Um, so I wanted to mention that. Uh, thank you very much, Anoop, uh, for that feedback and the tips. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, to all the investor pitch coaches for uh, joining today, for uh, explaining uh, a little bit how you look at your pitch, uh, at the different pitches for asking the questions to the founders. Of course, thank you very, very, very much to all the founders that pitched. Uh, even though I keep organizing these demo days, I personally hate pitching. Uh, that's why I don't pitch. I just uh, facilitate this. Um, I think you did a really good job. Um, I hope it uh, will help you uh, raise funding. Uh, I think I see all of you again next week on the speed dating event for Thursday. So all the investors, not just in the panel, but also in the audience, if you're interested, let us know and we'll uh, inform you about the scheduling and how it's going to work. We'll probably do that by Monday. Um, we had a prize winner for today. I think Erich is coming back online now. Is that correct? Erich? No, that's Bernard. Yes. Bernard, can, I... can you announce who the winner is, please? Yes. Um, okay, so the first winner. Okay, me. Um, don't mind here. Uh, okay, so the first winner is uh, to Gayatri Chahya Pertiwi. Yay. <laughs> okay, so uh, congratulations, Gayatri. Um, we'd like to offer you a um, one month uh, Flexi Desk Pass, good for um, any locations um, in Cohive. Uh, to redeem this, uh, please get our contact uh, from Robin or from the uh, crew at the Startup Buddy, and then we'll get in touch with you, or uh, get in touch with us. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Bernard. Uh, I'm really happy that you had to pronounce that, na that name, that helped also. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, uh, so congratulations to the winner. Uh, that rounds off uh, the event for today. Um, I just wanna mention few things before we're, sorry, I should have done that uh, an hour ago. Uh, a few small things before we totally close it off. For all the founders um, that wanna keep in touch with all their other founders, we have a WhatsApp community online. 
Uh, all the pitching founders of today uh, are in that community as well. We exchange their uh, ideas about how to find co-founders, how to improve your product, whatever uh, keeps uh, founders awake at night. So join that WhatsApp group if you like. Um, like I said, there is the pitch, uh, the speed dating next week. If you're a founder, make sure to subscribe to the Startup Buddy. If you're an investor, make sure to sign up on the platform and have a profile that we can match you. And with, with that, we're at the end of the program. The last people that I still want to thank, as always, is my own team. You have all seen Dr. Sharfri Sati, uh, who has been co-hosting. Uh, in the sidelines, we have had uh, Darvis and uh, Salsabil and Sakshi, who have been supporting you with coming online and uh, hopefully everything went smooth. If you have further ideas on how to improve our demo day for the future, please let us know. We tweak it all the time a little bit. This was the fourth one. The fifth one is probably going to be end of August, uh, start of September. So we hope you liked it and to see you all uh, back there. Uh, that's it for today. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks for inviting. Bye. Bye. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much.